Insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24. Welcome to the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. You are about to listen to an episode of the Audio Signals podcast with Marco Ciappelli. In this new season, Audio Signals is repositioning its antennas, focusing not just on the stories, but on the storytellers. In our modern hybrid analog digital society, the art of storytelling has never been more vital or displayed such a diverse array of forms. Recognizing this, our conversations will spotlight the narrators, providing a unique exploration into the minds behind the narratives. From authors to podcasters, visual artists to songwriters, and everything in between, we will engage with all who contribute to this extraordinary tapestry of human experience. We are all made of stories after all. Well, hello everybody, this is Marco Ciappelli. Welcome to another episode of Audio Signals Podcast, which, uh, as I mentioned lately, has been repositioning the antenna to cover not only stories and, uh, and talk about storytelling, but actually focusing on the storytellers themselves, because sometimes you can go with your fantasy, with your creativity and imagination, but sometimes there are people that has actually have lived the story that they talk about. And today, I'm very excited because this conversation is about a topic that I love very much. If you've been with me, you know I've talked with a few folks that have been uh, up there in the sky, um, <laughs> most of them on the on a space shuttle mission. And today, it's going to be with someone that has been, if I believe, on four of those missions. He wrote a few books about uh, the history of NASA and a few other topics related to space. And this one that we're going to talk about today, it's very interesting because it kind of put together a lot of what uh, could be the, the family of the, the space shuttle's adventures um, out of 135 mission. There has been a bunch of people, uh, astronauts, that have been up there. And what I understand is that Tom actually got to talk with uh, many many of them. And as I just mentioned, his name is Tom, Tom Johns. Welcome to the show. I think I spoke enough. I can just shut up for the rest of the episode now. Marco, good to be with you. And it's a conversation about my favorite topic, which is the, <laughs> the history of the space shuttle. And I got to participate in that program for 11 years as an astronaut. And it had a 30-year history. So uh, my last challenge over the last three years has been to write this book about the oral history of the space shuttle program. That's fantastic. It's, it's like you, you, you never had enough. You wanted to keep going back, even if not physically. You, you went back many times in your, in your mind, in your writing and, and sharing other stories. Well, I had the chance to fly four times, as you mentioned. And then when I finished my astronaut career, I wrote a memoir called Skywalking that came out about 15 years ago. And that was my story. I got to tell my personal perspective on my four journeys to space and helping build the space station. But I recognized that what was missing was the knowledge of everybody else's favorite stories. And so, um, you know, I have 22 astronaut classmates. I flew with 20 people in space. So I, I knew their stories fairly well. But I never had a chance to uh, just sit down casually and hear the experiences of the people who flew the shuttle in the first 10 years of the program back in the 80s. Um, and then when I left in 2001, uh, there was another 10 years of NASA shuttle flights where I was separated then by, by my change in career into writing, into speaking and consulting. So I wanted to hear their stories too, of the people who actually built and completed the International Space Station. So this was my chance with this project, Space Shuttle Stories, to sit down, as we're doing, and talk to my astronaut colleagues and hear their firsthand impressions in a way I'd never had the chance to when we were so busy working at NASA. 
Yeah, and I, I consider myself very lucky. I'm not uh, astronaut material myself, but I've been having a huge admiration for that. Maybe it's because I was born the year that we actually landed on the moon. I was a few months old when that happened, but uh, I don't know. My fascination always been uh, there, and I've been lucky. I mentioned to you before we started recording to talk with people like Eileen Collins and uh, Pam Pamela Melroy and uh, Charles Camarda, Bill MacArthur, which you all knew personally. So <laughs> it's yeah. it's really cool the fact that you did the same thing. Um, so the, you kind of told us about the ideas and we'll get more into the book. A little background about yourself, just to get started about the story of the storytellers. How did you get involved with this idea of becoming an astronaut? You don't do it by, by I don't know, random... Uh, destiny, right? It, it... Well, I'm sure in the, in the 1960s, when I was growing up during the space race between you know the U.S. and the Soviet Union, the race to the moon, I'm sure I was one of millions of kids who wanted to become an astronaut. But uh, in my case, I was growing up in Baltimore, Maryland, in the mid-Atlantic here, and I was a Cub Scout, and I got to go on a field trip to the rocket factory about a mile and a half from my house. And the Martin Marietta Company that's now Lockheed Martin, but they were building the rockets to carry the Gemini astronauts into space to rehearse our moon landing techniques. So here I am in my hometown and the space race had come to my town. And I got a chance as a little kid to see these hundred foot tall silver missiles being built to carry the astronauts two by two up into space on Gemini. So at that point I said, well, here's a job that seems really cool and I should learn more about this, this job. So then I began to lear learn and read about the astronaut career path. And back then it was all test pilots, you know, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Mike Collins, all test pilots, all professional aviators. And I thought in the late sixties, as I went into high school, that that would be the path that I would have to follow. So to, in order to learn how to fly, I went to the Air Force Academy out in Colorado and became a, an Air Force pilot. And then the new space shuttle came out. So what inspired me was the fact that there were lots of scientists and engineers on the space shuttle flights on these crews. And that was my favorite subject in school, science. So I thought, well, hey, if I get better science credentials, maybe I can better qualify for uh, a slot in the astronaut corps. And it's very competitive, as you know. Um, I had a lot of luck breaking my way so that I could get qualified to become an astronaut. And then in the competition itself, uh, I was turned down on two separate selections of new astronauts. And then the third time, I finally had enough items on my resume, enough work experience, uh, plus my jet flying time and my work as a scientist that I, I could be a competitive candidate. So there were 3,000 applicants that year, and uh, they interviewed 120 face-to-face, -face, and then they picked 23. And I was lucky enough to be in that group. So it only took me... Marco, it only took me 29 years from seeing the rockets in the factory till the time I got to fly in space. So, but I did have a lot of fun along the way and it was always a dream to shoot for. I always tried to maneuver my career in the direction of being qualified for space flight. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that you grew up right next to that factory, definitely it's like, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's meant to be, maybe it's meant to be. Yeah. And the fact that, that you, had to apply several times. This is a recurring story that I hear every time I talk to to an astronaut. That it it seems obviously it's not uh, a job that you just apply with no credential, obviously. And uh, but it's incredible the amount of people that do want to do this. And and I'm I'm honored to have been talking even with the women that became then commander of mission because uh, let's face it, at that time, from what I understand, it was even harder for them to to make that dream come true. Um, let's go into into the space shuttle. So first reusable uh, rocket, no, not really, not the rocket itself, but you know, it needs a rocket to go up there. What make it so special so that we can start discussing this, this book? So it was a groundbreaking machine. It was a departure from the Apollo missions and the earlier space flight programs. Mercury and Gemini, where everything was uh, used just once. Everything was thrown away. The only piece of the Apollo spacecraft that launched from Kennedy Space Center was the little command module where the three astronauts actually lived 
during their passage to and from the moon. And that's all that came back. Everything else was discarded. So NASA said, okay, with our next generation spaceship, we want a reusable craft that can be turned around and flown 25 or 50 times a year so that we can make it the national launch system, the, the booster for all national security and Pentagon payloads, all the scientific payloads, all the commercial communication satellites. We all want them to ride on the space shuttle. And we're going to make it cheap enough in its operation that everybody can afford to put their rocket, their payloads on this new uh, rocket system. So that was their ambition. And even though they did develop the first reusable space plane uh, and two thirds of the system was reusable, it did not save money because the inspections and um, preparations for each flight required a big workforce that cost a lot of money to maintain. So it wasn't a money saver for NASA. And the spacecraft was never as reliable and routine in its flights as the original designers had hoped. So instead of it being an airliner type operation, it became an experimental craft for the whole of its 30 year history. But it was a bridge to the 21st century. And so it gave us a platform in space where we learned to do very complex operations in low earth orbit, 200 miles up above the planet. And we did the Hubble Space Telescope restoration and, and upgrades. We built the International Space Station. We launched probes to the planets. Many communication satellites and scientific satellites were launched from the shuttle. And it was um, a mini laboratory with the space lab and space hab modules. We practiced for the science that we would do on the International Space Station. So even though it didn't realize all the dreams of its designers, the space shuttle was the iconic vision of working and living in space for 30 years. And it built the foundation on which the modern 21st century spacecraft are, are flying on today. And it makes me think that without that, you wouldn't have as many people probably being in space. Uh, you would not be able to probably work on and build the International Space Station and uh, and give access to people that are not with a military background, but they're like scientists and, and people that are sent to do other things to just be sure that you pilot, get to a place, come back safely on Earth. So tell me about all these people that you talk to, um, 130. And I'm, I'm just imagine I have a very vivid imagination. I visualize thing. It's just you, you know, getting with one of your fellow astronauts and be like, do you remember when? <laughs> what is your best memory? How, how did that go? The process of writing the book, getting in touch with them. There was like mm -hmm. excitement from, from them when they heard from you. I was like, yeah, I mean, I, I know you all love to talk about this. I mean, that's my experience. <laughs> it was a great opportunity for me personally, because I did get a chance to talk with over 130 individuals. I think I interviewed 133. And then I borrowed, you know, from previously published interviews in a couple of cases to, to round out the 135 space shuttle missions. So what I wanted to do was to ask everybody about the, the, the most rewarding, the most satisfying experiences they had, the most anxious, the the most fun experiences. And I, so I had a set of questions that I would email them in advance. And just about the time I started this project, realizing that I could um, talk to 135 people altogether, you know, that was practically doable. I couldn't talk to all, you know, um, 833 who flew on the space shuttle. You know, um, there were 355 individual astronauts and cosmonauts who flew on the shuttle. No way I could actually talk to 355 and record interviews. So recognizing that I had this challenge, I just set up a spreadsheet and I looked at all 135 missions. And I said, of course, I know most of these people from my profession and, and from astronaut reunions and so on. Who can I tap on the shoulder to talk to me? And so that was my choice. I got to choose one astronaut from each flight. In some cases, they were crewmates that I'd flown with to cover some of our space flights together. In others, they were people that I'd worked with on the space station program. But um, one of the joys of the project was just out of the blue, emailing somebody like Dick Truly, who was on you know, the second space shuttle mission and asking him how his flight went. I never had a chance to do that. And I got to talk to the 
the surviving uh, members of the first six women astronauts and talk to them about their groundbreaking missions. First African-American astronaut, Guy Bluford as well. So it was a chance for me to really sit down and put these missions and experiences in perspective. And everybody was very positive and, and, and giving of their time. It took about 45 minutes usually to talk to them. And then after two and a half years of recording these interviews, it was time to then take a year to edit them down, take the transcripts and edit them down to something that could be put on the page, about 550 words per page uh, for each mission. So it was a both a logistical challenge, but it was also very rewarding along the way to get the chance to talk to all these folks. And I hope they're very happy with um, the way their stories have turned out because I got to add 600 plus amazing photos to go with their missions. And I think that was a, uh, one of the most enjoyable parts of the book was to pick my favorite shuttle photos over 30 years and, and put them in the book. And are these photos taken by by them personally? I know a lot of people on, on the space shuttle or on the International Space Station does, they do fun stuff. They kind of entertain, they, they, they share, they do a lot of STEM, they talk to people, they, mm -hmm. you know, they do a little PR, let's say, for what they're doing out there. Seeing people playing song <laughs> on a guitar and, and yeah. experiment. So were those pictures part of their own uh, personal archive? I mean, I, I guess it's, nothing is personal there, but that they actually took themselves? Yeah, you know, the NASA and the government own the photos, but they're public domain, so anybody can use them. Right. So it was, that was not a problem for me. Uh, they're all largely cataloged on the internet at, at NASA's um, photography website. I think it's called uh, Gateway to Astronaut Photography of Earth is one site. And the other one is NASA's Image and Video Library website, where you can just look up any mission and see the dozens of uh, digital photos that are posted there. Not all equally. Um, so the earlier missions, the first 10 years of the shuttle, there's a paucity of uh, photos. Maybe only about 25 might be online um, mm. of, of the film shots that were taken. And once we switched to digital around 2000, right. Uh, many hundreds of pictures became posted on the internet, of course, by NASA. So what I did was when I interviewed a friend or a colleague, I would say, give me your five or six favorite pictures from your right. mission. Yeah. Then they sent those to me and I put them into the mix to add perspective and context to the story that we were trying to tell. And then, of course, there were um, if there are five or six people on a crew, everybody's taking dozens of pictures every day. So you really can't point to who took the pictures, but mm -hmm. you get you get the team view and that's how we treat these pictures is that they were taken by the team not some individual even though i might remember which ones i took here and there right. mostly it was about giving the team credit for those those images right now where i was going to go with the the personal touch on the story and i love the fact that either they took the photo or they they choose them themselves is that maybe um i was trying to get into the the mindset of how this interview was going once you get the opportunity to get it started, meaning were they leaning towards more technical aspect of the flight, more the scientific uh, discovery, or most were more like memories and experience that maybe inspire them to come back to planet Earth and say, you know, I mean, I'm kind of touching on the overview effect right. or other experience that it may have up there. Well, with the, the sample questions that I sent to them were um, to steering them towards their personal experiences. You know, I did ask, give me an overview, an elevator speech of your mission. What would be the themes of the mission that you could just give me in just a minute or so? But then we spent the bulk of the time saying, what was most satisfying? What was most rewarding? What frightened you the most? What were you most worried about? And what was the, the um, what were your impressions of your crewmates who, who made a a special impression on you. So we covered a lot of territory and obviously I could not edit that down and put it all in the book. But what I tr tried to do was from each individual, I would get something unique that hadn't been talked about before. Um, try to get something that was unique about not only their experience, but tell me something unique about the mission that distinguished it from the other 134 that there were. And so I, I think I was pretty successful in varying across these stories um, a lot of different new stories that you'll still be surprised by when you're on mission 133. Um, but at the same time, um, you'll see some common themes throughout the book. You know, the, the excitement of their first space shuttle launch was always a theme that people would talk about. Um, 
uh, the amazing experience of flying back through a hypersonic reentry was another one. And what came through loud and clear was the satisfaction of being part of a team that was doing something really extraordinary and special. That was common. And then the uh, just the the view of our planet from space. Almost every astronaut touched on the the awe that they would experience in looking back at the home planet. So now I don't have 135 you know, passages saying how neat the earth looked because that does get repetitive, <laughs> but I took the best of those impressions. And I think I, I got them nailed down in the book too. So it was great to hear the common themes, but also to be surprised by things I'd never heard before. Mm. Anything in particular that, that you want to kind of tease and oh, sure. that I, really I, stick out I, in your mind? I, You know, we lost two shuttles and 14 astronauts on those two accidents on Challenger and Columbia. So, you know, we lost Columbia in 2003 because of the heat shield being compromised by damage from debris that struck the heat shield during launch. Um, but long before 2003, there was a shuttle mission STS-27 uh, in 1988, just two flights after Challenger was lost. And this crew took off and their heat shield was damaged by debris coming off of their solid rocket booster. And when they got to orbit, they saw these um, hundreds of damaged heat shield tiles. And Hoot Gibson, who I quote in the, in the book, said the first time he looked at the camera view of their heat shield, he said, we are going to die because of the compromised heat shield. He didn't think that they could make it back. However, They completed their uh, Pentagon mission. It was a classified military mission. Completed that, then you have to come home. You, there was no way to repair the heat shield by going on a spacewalk. They, we didn't have those tools at the time. And so they had to put the ship on its reentry path and bring it back home. And Hoot Gibson, the commander, along with Guy Gardner, who talks about the experience, They were watching the gauges on the instrument panel, looking for any sign that the heat shield was burning through or that the flight controls were not going to operate properly. And so they, you know, Gibson gritted his teeth for 45 minutes through the reentry uh, arena and brought the ship back into a safe landing. And so they made it back to the ground. When they got out, they looked at the space shuttle on the runway and there were over 700 damaged tiles. One was completely burned away by the damage that had been inflicted. And now the metal skin of the orbiter was starting to melt. Uh, fortunately, they passed through the peak heating phase before it had a burn through. They got back on the ground. But if NASA had only remembered how close they came to catastrophe in 1988, then in 2003, 15 years later, we might not have had that same problem with Columbia. If they'd only... Uh, internalize that lesson and beaten that problem of debris damage to a minimum. Yeah, and I, I remember this story because, again, talking to Eileen Collins that she commanded the return to flight and, and Charlie Camarda that was on that. I remember there was a they were talking clearly about the tension and, and something that did happen. If I remember, there was some kind of like a belly flip that they did to track the uh, They actually shield underneath, and so they, they were very aware of the of all of this. And uh, I mean, the, the, there is a big risk. Uh, it's not like going to the coffee shop and <laughs> and get your cappuccino in the morning. So a uh, uh, big uh, big admiration for all that they've done. Let's let's talk about the fact that now we're going back to to the moon. At least that's the plan. I was listening just this morning about. Um, private company landing um, mm -hmm. a robotic uh, piece on the moon, very hard to land there, apparently. Um, but we've done it many times. And then for 50 years, <laughs> nothing happened. And But we're going back now there. Um, have you guys touched in the book about the future where, where this astronaut sees NASA going and the, maybe the collaboration of private and, um, and NASA? being the the good solution for the next step to go back up there i think that the lessons conveyed in space shuttle stories uh, uh, from the space shuttle program are still applicable to our efforts to return to the moon uh, and it's all about remembering the near catastrophic mistakes that occurred during the shuttle program the fact that we did have two accidents 
if we can remember those lessons as told by the astronauts in this book and convey them to the people who are both managing and preparing technically for our return to the moon, then we'll have a, a way to reduce the risk of going back into deep space and returning astronauts to the moon in, a, in, a, in an ambitious way. I'm very excited by uh, the prospect of us getting boots back on the, the moon's surface in the next three years or so. Um, I think it's time to tap into the resources that are available on the moon to help us go farther by, you know, finding propellants on the moon in the form of water ice at the poles of the moon. But, you know, the space shuttle taught us almost everything that we know how to do well in space. And we're applying those lessons on the International Space Station today. And, and then those go forward from the shuttle and the station into developing the way we operate on these lunar return missions. And so I hope that we can remember the costly lessons of the past and the value of this book, I think, is that it trains explorers and managers and flight controllers in the mindset of what you have to look for when you're facing the unexpected. And the technology that have been used on the on the space shuttle, I mean, it, it, because it's been going for so many years, that mission, I know there have been adaptation to the, the computer system throughout the years and many adjustments for security reason, but also I'm, I'm assuming for performance and, you know, there is several um, of this machine that they, they all look the same, but they're probably not the same, I would say. And, uh, and how do you apply this? How, how much of the space shuttle goes into the next mission that maybe uh, in the next few years is going to bring people on the moon? Well, in a very concrete way, the uh, the new moon rocket that NASA's developed called the Space Launch System, it's the big booster that's going to carry the Artemis uh, missions to the moon. The Orion spacecraft is at the top of the SLS. That new SLS launcher uses ex extended solid rocket motors from the shuttle program. Uh, there are three main engines at the base of the shuttle orbiter, but there are four of those same motors on the base of the uh, core stage of the space launch system. So shuttle technology is directly incorporated into the new moon rocket for the Artemis program. And then in the way that we will do um, spacewalks on the moon, the moonwalks, if you will, you know, we're not gonna be using the old space shuttle suit, but the lessons we've learned over 30 years of, we're still operating that suit on the space station, that translates directly into the, the design of the new moon suit. And then I think it's more um, the other intellectual transfer is, again, when you make mistakes, let's learn from them and let's carry them forward in the way the control team operates in Houston, in the way the astronauts operate in their spacecraft. And while we've automated much of the functions of flying a spacecraft to the moon, and most of the job of piloting now is going to be robotically done rather than flown by a test pilot, they still have to be able to recognize the unexpected situation and step in. And as you say, it's a difficult task to land on the moon. I bet you there's going to be someone, a human in the loop, just as they were in flying the shuttle to a safe landing. I think you'll find a human in the loop for landing people on the, the lunar surface. Well, you know, with all the AI that we have, I, I still think we need to to have the human supervision, but that's a different <laughs> different story that applies even here on, on our planet. Um, I would like to go into storytelling. Uh, this this show is about that, and I would like to tap with you into the reason why you do write the book that you write. Um, how you decide? Well, I'm going to talk about this one instead of being about my career or about something else in terms of technology and and space exploration but it, it's going to be more personal so where i'm going with this is education i always tell we're made of stories I, I i like the idea that we inspire the next generation we inspire change in our planet and i think that when you have the experience and by you i mean all of you astronauts that have been up there you're a very important um, piece of the storytelling. You're all amazing storytelling. I mean, anyone I've talked to, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. The importance of sharing these stories for, for our future, for the next generation. I'm, I love your thoughts on that. 
that was my motivation for this book because I hadn't heard the stories of my friends in sufficient detail. We have an astronaut reunion every couple of years and you'll see your crewmates and you'll see some of your astronaut classmates and you'll sit around at a dinner table and you'll hear a few stories here and there. But nobody had produced a record of all of these missions and, and tried to capture the essence of those missions in uh, a human framework. Now there is NASA, Johnson Space Center in Houston, they have an oral history program where they've talked to, you know, a good chunk of individuals, probably maybe 15% or so of the shuttle astronauts have been interviewed for that program. But because of funding, they've suspended it. So there is no ongoing effort to systematically capture the shuttle crew members' stories. So that's where I thought I could help out with the storytelling effort is to tackle at least one from every mission. And I was glad I was able to do that in this in this three-year project. So it is very important to convey those stories for um, future lessons learned, but also to get the, the human spirit of exploration on, on the record. Because, you know, it, it's all paid for in, in the NASA case and the International Space Station case. It's all paid for by the taxpayers of all these international countries working together, they deserve a chance to hear what the experience is really like and, and what kind of people they're sending into space and what they do up there. So that was really a, something in my mind was to give back to the people who made these adventures possible. And then uh, the younger generation is a target for a book like this, because um, I regularly go out and speak at schools. I'm going to one tomorrow to talk to um, a young audience in an elementary school about how they can participate in human space exploration in the future. They might be the people who first walk on Mars in about 20 years. So I wanted to take um, these, these historical lessons from the space shuttle, which you know stopped flying in 2011. We have a lot of students I'll be talking to tomorrow who never saw the space shuttle fly for real. They've seen uh, it no, on TV. I, I saw the last flight. I was on a, I'm in LA, so I saw it when it you know, it was going over uh, the beaches there and right. then landed mm -hmm. in the old parade. So sorry, I had to interrupt because it just came in my mind. It was it was oh. a piece of the history right there. So I wanted to, you know, I want to make this uh, this machine that retired 12 years ago. I want it to come alive in their minds yeah. by reading this book and then encourage them towards putting themselves in that same story 20 years from now when we uh, are heading out to deep space and to the asteroids and Mars. Well, let me ask you this, and, and this I asked is, I think a, a couple of other times, and, and not just to astronauts, but other people that talk about space, and that excitement when you when you look at the movie. I mean, you, you have people like me that I love to read book about Apollo eight and the, the the landing on the moon, the whole Merc I mean, they all race to space. It's fascinating to me, and I get excited, really excited, but. I don't see even in the news the excitement that we used to have in in the sixties, uh, in the even in the seventies, and, and maybe the one that we had in nineteen eighty one when there was the first space shuttle and and so on. Kind of like I feel like it plateaued a little bit, and and I I'm not I'm not happy about it because <laughs> you know I love this stuff. Where do you see? Uh, the issue am i is this just in my head or do you think that there is a little bit less interest in in the general population for what happened up there i think there's still an interest i i do think younger people are still excited by you know dinosaurs and astronauts and and you know going to the moon it's Don't the same it thing the same category <laughs> yeah um i believe that that the potential there is to is to um excite these people to embark on their own path of exploration. And, and I always tell people we need their, we need their skills, their talents, their inventions to help us do things 20 years in the future, like, like set foot on Mars and, and continue the search for life there. Um, because of the frequency of human spaceflight has dropped off since the retirement of the shuttle, um, we're only going up you know twice to the space station every year. Um, we're flying a couple of private missions every couple of years on these new, you know, Crew Dragon spacecraft or the new Blue Origin uh, spaceship or the Boeing Starliner. Uh, the frequency has gone down, so it's not in the news as much. But I do believe that when you put people back on the moon for two weeks at a time and every day there's video of them looking over the next boulder or across the next ridge or through the next across the next crater looking for the discoveries that will mean we can have a permanent presence on the moon and they can be a part of that. 
I do believe when we when we see people in deep space looking back from a spacewalk and there is the Earth and the moon in the same frame while they're working on building this little mini space station called the Gateway around the uh, the moon, that will excite people again. Um, complemented certainly by robotic visions from Mars <laughs> and from the moon. But we don't give parades for robots. You know, we, we give parades for people who are putting the human presence out there. And even uh, in the 21st century, I don't think we're so jaded that we still don't live vicariously in, uh, through the excitement seen through the eyes of an astronaut or an explorer out there on the surface of the moon. I think that's that excitement level is going to come back when they realize how it's possible now for the average person to go to space. And eventually the average person is going to be able to go to the surface of the moon on a, an extended vacation in a, in a generation, you'll be able to go to a hotel in low earth orbit, I think. Yeah. It's, it's always hard for me to pick my questions because we can go in many different direction and the time is limited. So again, uh, I guess I said at the beginning, if you had fun, I invite you to come back and talk about other things. Uh, be, amongst the other things that I see on the kind of like the, the, the script of possible question, well, there is one that you talk about space tourism, and that's that's very interesting to me to see how commercial and it's going to drive the next phase of um, of space exploration. But there is one thing that I that I want to finish with, which is that you went to and travel to some of the sites that you saw when you were flying around. And, and those are big sites like the Suez and Panama Canal or the pyramids or any other thing that you see up there. And I'm always fascinated when I see these fast moving you know, sunset, sunrise, and aurora borealis, and all of that. When when you go on rotation on the the space shuttle, and or the International Space Station, uh, how, how did you pick those, and what made you decide? Well, okay, I've been in space four times. Now I'm going to go visit <laughs> some of these places here on the planet. Right, you get this incredible view of the home planet from orbit. And you realize that you're never going to live long enough to see every one of the marvels down there on the Earth's surface that you might see from space. But I tried to take pictures of my favorite spots having to do with uh, the history of, the, uh, of our society, on the, our civilization. How, do, how did we migrate from Africa across Asia and into Europe? You know, what were the big, um, the big voyages of the age of discovery back 500 years ago when we circumnavigated the globe for the first time and discovered the new world? So those are the kinds of themes that I would... I would be interested in looking at the earth. And so I've been able to go on my bucket list uh, to some of those places. I haven't been to Antarctica yet, and I'd like <laughs> to get there. But, you know, I have gone to, you know, the World War II Normandy beaches, mm -hmm. uh, where the course of World War II changed in Europe. I've been out in the Pacific and gone to Hawaii and Pearl Harbor and visited some of the, the islands in the Philippines where, you know, on the earth science front, I saw erupting volcanoes there. But on the on the uh, the history front, the Philippines uh, were a big part of the the Second World War campaigns in the Pacific. So those are places that I try to get to. Uh, just recently, I got to the Far East for the first time, and I wasn't I'm not old enough to have flown uh, for the Air Force in Vietnam. My Air Force career was just after the Vietnam War ended, but I just recently got to Vietnam and visit that country and see a little bit of the the way the history is told by the communist regime in Vietnam. And, you know, I know my side of the story, but I'd, I, it was interesting to see the perspective of the communist government there. You know, I think it's biased, but it was still interesting to see the people of Vietnam today and, you know, um, be happy for them that there's been no shooting over there for the last 50 years and, you know, visit a society that was such a big part of American history. So those are my ambitions is to get to as many spots like that around the planet that I've seen from space that I can touch with my own hands, with my own eyes uh, in, in the years I've got left. And I, I love that. And we're going to close with the, with these thoughts, because I when I talk about society and technology, I often say, especially now with generative AI, and we never talk about ethics and we never talk about looking into biases and things that we that we have done in, in the past. And, and, and again, going to philosophical conversation about technology uh, like we've done in these days because you, you almost like find yourself looking at yourself in the mirror with 
with AI. And I felt like we have done the same thing with space exploration. Um, astronauts went up there and discovered new things about humanity, uh, kind of like testing the limits. And then as you do, you, you kind of find more interest in what the planet is and maybe you see it more of a unity so it's it's exciting that you went there you got inspired to to by looking down to then say yep i, I got to go to see this place i need to look back into into her history and um i don't know do, do you think that's the main reason why we go to space to learn more about who we are and you know, it's what? undeniable that uh, as human beings we are curious and we do want to see what's over the next horizon. So, you know, from orbital perspective, I got to look over the horizon, you know, 848 orbits of the Earth. I got to see a lot of, of, of the geography and geology and uh, life on our planet from space. But I haven't had a chance to experience that personally. So, you know, over my horizon here on the terrestrial level, I want to get over that to that next place where I can make a new discovery that would satisfy my own curiosity. But that's what drives us out into deep space is to, you know, look for new resources to make our lives better on the moon. Eventually uh, resources, the asteroids will be tapped and then we'll find knowledge on Mars that will help us develop as a species. And I think ultimately um, I love this planet, but we have to establish ourselves on other worlds so that we'll survive some potential catastrophe of the future, whether it's a, a rogue asteroid or a, another pandemic. So it's an insurance policy for us. And, you know, that's what's driving us forward is, is that curiosity plus the desire to make sure that our species goes on. It's, it's, it's some, something internal that does maybe even subconsciously drive us forward. Right, right. Well, Tom, I want to thank you so much for spending this time with me and uh, telling a little portion of your many stories. But uh, uh, I want to invite everybody to find your book and the experience and the stories. Again, very short story of their experience in, uh, in perspective of, uh, of all the uh, 135 mission that the Space Shuttle um, flew and and all the stories that are told firsthand by astronauts that have been up there. I know that the book has been uh, published October 31st, 2023, so it's available for everybody. I'll put links to get in touch with Tom and his website and all his social media to the book, and uh, I invite everybody to to read it. I certainly will. And Tom, thank you so very much for sharing all these stories with us. It's a pleasure, and I hope folks enjoy the book. I hope so, too. Thank you very much. Everybody stay tuned, check the notes, subscribe, and there'll be many more stories coming to you from Audio Signals. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Audio Signals with Marco Ciappelli. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then add this show to your favorite podcast player, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and share the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to connect your brand to our conversations and our audience, visit itspmagazine.com to learn how to sponsor one or more of our shows. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. Insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24.